but it says, it shall be a sign upon your arm and a reminder between your eyes. And that's the reference to tefillin. We have two more references in the book of Deuteronomy when we're learning about uh, 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 the, sh about the uh, commandment to heed God's word, Shema Yisrael. But the, but, the, but the initial lesson about tefillin is found in Exodus. After we teach our children, it says that it shall be a sign upon our hand and a reminder between our eyes. So what is that all about? Well, it emphasizes that, it, th that our faith, our nation, our people, the Israelite nation, is not, a, is not an autocratic society where we're led by individuals. We are all leaders. All Israelites are leaders. We're trained to be leaders. And through the story that I just told, through the story of Yitro with de delegation, and through the story of how we received Torah at Sinai, by God not giving the laws to Moses, but reciting it from on high to all the people gathered at the base of the mountain. We see a delegation, a distribution, and a democratization of leadership. And that's to quote Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Oliver Shalom of recent uh, uh, passing, uh, where he says that, and this is very important, that the Israelites are responsible each for one another not only for their families and for their and, and for themselves, but for the moral, spiritual state of the nation as a whole. We know this phrase, call Yisrael Arevim Zebazah. Each of us, each Israelite is responsible one for another. And to me, that is the lesson this year about wearing tefillin. When we put on the tefillin, we are recalling the exodus from Egypt. We are recalling the fact that each one of us received Torah from Sinai, and we are remembering that each day we are commanded to learn, to teach, to observe, and to do the words that we say before the Shema every morning, to learn, to teach, to observe, and to do. And that's what wearing tefillin is about. And that's why we wear tefillin. So let's take a look at the tefillin and see the symbolism that comes with this practice that in Torah, it only says it. It shall be a sign upon your arm and a reminder between your eyes. So we have a couple of uh, photos to show you as, as we progress through this. So the first show, photo was put together by a friend of mine at my synagogue. This is his grandfather's tefillin. And he, he put together this diorama that we've been using for the last 20 years uh, when we teach in the Hebrew school. And you'll see that there is um, two boxes. And, and the word for box that we use is bayit, which is the same as a house because it houses the parchment uh, that's put in, inside. So you'll see on the top left corner, uh, the, the box that's the shell roche, the head. The, the part that goes on the head and and uh, in the middle right you're going to see the box that's the shell uh yad the yad the arm the shell yad and you see the straps you see the customary tefillin bag and then you'll see pieces of parchment and there are four uh sections of parchment and and the four are the two references in shemot that i talked about and then the two references in uh, Devarim, in the book of uh, uh, Devarim, Deuteronomy, which also references the it. It shall be a sign upon your arm and a reminder between your eyes. And this is the parchment. It is written similar to Torah. It is written on animal skin, uh, parchment. It is uh, written by hand using the same ink that's used to write Torah. It is written by a scribe. And so, so this is the parchment that's placed inside the baitim, the, the, the boxes that we put on our head and on our arm. So Bob, if you can go to the next slide. This slide is the shell yad. Bob? All right, well, I'm not getting the next slide. 
So um, looking at the box that's on the middle right of the diorama, you, you can see, on, there it is. So the parchment that's in the shell yard is one piece of parchment on which the four sections of Torah are written. And they're written on one piece of parchment. There's one compartment and it's placed in the shell yard. The box is, is a plain box. It's a uh, plain box. These are made out of leather, very compressed, hard leather under uh, much pressure to put these together. They're in perfect cubes, perfect cubes with sharp corners, black, and they're sewn together with uh, sinew from a kosher animal. And uh, they're, 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 these boxes, they're not made out of wood, they're made out of leather. And this is the inside of the shell yard. And now the shell roche. The shell roche is different in several aspects. First of all, the shell roche on the inside, there are four compartments. And each one of the four verses is put into one individual compartment. In addition, on the outside of the shell roche, you'll see that looking straight down from the top, I don't know if you can see here, but there are four lines. And those four lines indicate the four compartments that are in the uh, Bayit shell roche. In addition, on the side of the shell roche, you'll see that there is a shin on each side, on two of the four sides, on opposite sides. And it's interesting that one has four prongs and one has the customary three prongs. And there's many different explanations for why, whether it's the seven days of the week or the imaot and the avot, the four, 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 three forefathers and, and four foremothers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. There's many, seven days of the week. There's, there's many different explanations for that. But the shin uh, is, of course, the first, le first letter in the name of God that we use when we put on tefillin. It's the name of God that was used for God in the beginning of Torah, before we use yud Hey vav Hey, we use shin Dalid yud Shaddai. And we're going to spell uh, the name of God, Shaddai, twice when we put on tefillin, once with the, on the arm and once with on the uh, head. So let's start and, and put on the uh, tefillin. So Bob, if you can put up the brachot, I would appreciate that. So the first thing we do is we put on the, the talit, so if everybody could take their talit and we'll put on the talit and we'll say the bracha which should be on your screen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu lihitate b'atzitzit. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gave us commandments and commanded us to wear the tzitzit. And we put on the talit. Next, we take the shell yad because we put on the shell yad first, and we say the bracha for wearing the shell yad. The shell yad is the one with the plain box. There's no shin on the box, and it has a slip knot to slip over your bicep. So we put it on the bicep. You put it on your weaker arm. You put it, if you're a right-handed person, you put it on your left arm. If you're a left-handed person, you put it on your right arm. If you're ambidextrous, the sages tell us to put it on our left arm, closer to the heart. So we put it on the bicep, like so, where the box is pointed towards the heart. And I know on the uh, Zoom, it looks like it's my right arm, but I am putting it on my left arm. And we wrap it a couple of times around the bicep to secure it. Doesn't matter how you, how you do it or how many times. And then we wrap it on the forearm and we wrap it on the forearm seven times. And to remember seven, we can either do the mundane thing of counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or we can take the phrase from uh, the ashray, 
which says, and God opens his hand and sustains the living. And that has seven words in it. And we can do that to wrap to the, the tefillin. And that's what I will demonstrate. Poteach et yadecha umasbiach lechol chai ratzon. And with experience, you'll learn how tight to do it so that you don't cut off circulation, but it doesn't continually slide down and interrupt your, your prayer. We take the rest and we're gonna get back to that later. So we just wrap it around the palm for the time being. And we take the shell roche. The shell roche, we say the bracha and, and it's going to slip over our head. So Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushanim, B'mitzvot Tavetzivanu, Al Mitzvot Tefillin. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gave us commandments and commanded us to, to do the commandment of wearing tefillin. Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Leolam Ba'ed, and we declare God as our sovereign. And we put the shell rosh on. The knot should be in the back of your head where the skull meets the spine. There's a soft spot there. And the box goes between the eyes by the hairline or where the hairline used to be because that's where the, the portions of the skull fuse together after childbirth. So now we do the hand. And in the hand, what we're doing is we're reciting three verses from uh, the book of Hosea. And this cements the relationship that we're demonstrating when we wear the tefillin. This is declaring the partnership, the love, and the, and the uh, responsibility that we have to do mitzvot, to love our God, and to heed God's commandments. So what we do, holding the hand down, we wrap it three times around the middle finger, there's many different ways to do this. I do it the way my uncles taught me, but we could do it any, many different ways. As long as we do three times around the middle finger, once around the third and fourth fingers, and then around the top of the palm. So as we do the middle finger, we say the three verses from Hosea. V'erastichli li'olam, I betroth you to me forever. V'erastichli uh, I betroth you to with righteousness and justice, with love and compassion. And then the third time, the Aristichli, the Adat et Adonai, and I betroth you to me with faithfulness, and then shall you be at one with Adonai. And then we do the two fingers, the ring finger and the middle finger. And then we do the top of the palm to make a shin. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, I came across the top and then through the middle here to make a shin. And then we just wrap the excess. I told you we would be spelling the name Shaddai twice. So on the head, we have the shin on the, on the bite. We have the shin. We have the dalid on the, excuse me, on the knot. And we have the yud. If you look at the end of the strap, it's cut to simulate a yud. It's cut on an angle. So we have Shaddai. And on the arm, we spell it again. We have the shin on the top of your hand. We have the dalid over here uh, by, by, by the, the part that went across the palm and the middle finger. And we have the yud again with the middle finger. So we spell Shaddai again. So there's many, many other traditions and many, many other stories about Tefillin. It is one of our oldest practices. Archaeologists have found remnants of uh, Israelites wearing Tefillin thousands of years ago. Um, it is a marvelous tradition to get used to when you're saying your morning prayers. Um, it has, it, it, you'll find, I think, that in wearing tefillin, it's going to resonate as part of this relationship that we have with God when we do our morning prayers. I am sorry to have to uh, rush through this presentation, but we're all time bound because we have a, a wonderful service planned by Michael Freilich, a learner's minion, and then we have a speaker at 10 o'clock uh, 
uh, Central Time, 11 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, we have speakers, uh, Rabbi Rosenthal and Elian and Rabbi Willensfields talking to us about tefillin. So I am going to conclude now. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, good morning, Boker Tov. And I believe, Bob, you're beginning uh, Minyan now. Thank you. Bob, you're on mute. Thank you, Norm. Thank you very much. And uh, that was uh, excellent. And wish you a Boker Tov and good okay, rest of your wrap. So now I'd like to turn to Michael Freilich, who's going to lead us in the, uh, in the morning service. Uh, Michael is a Seaboard Region Advisor and one of our greatest teachers, our Masim Tovim for the region and uh, often leads us in, the, in uh, these services and, and uh, has a great wealth of knowledge and experience in this instruction. So, uh, Michael. Booker Tov, all you all. In Hebrew, that means, hi, everybody. The all you all is from my daughter-in-law who lives and grown up in Texas. I was saying the best way to start in a, uh, in a learning menu is to start with the uh, table of contents of the CJOR you're looking at. If you're in Sim Shalem, that's Roman numeral a uh, little four, a little Roman numeral four. Yeah, we'll, be using, we'll be using the Sim Shalom mm -hmm. today. So do you see it? I've got to figure out how to make mine not blurred. I'll work from the book. All right. We did the preliminary, we did the uh, preliminary prayers. They typically put in a Kaddish to Robert. Let me explain something. I've, we're not gonna do an awful lot of davening. We will do a little and I'll talk you through it, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background of how the prayer service has been imposed, what it consists of and how we handle parts of it. So the first thing you see are the preliminary prayers. The preliminary prayers, if you'll turn to page, well, first look at the table of contents. You have the morning service, you have preliminary prayers, which includes putting on the toss and the fill-in. You have the Kaddish to Rabbanan, which we'll talk about for a moment. Kaddish to Rabbanan, when we had the academies in Sura and Pompadita in Babylonia, was said when they finished their prayers or when they began their prayers in the academies. The Suke to Zimra means uh, a suke, verses of praise or song to God. The next is the Shahari service, the next is the Amidah, and then Javieno, and then several other minor prayers, and then Tachman, which I'll explain later on. So the preliminary prayers we begin on page one. One of the other things you should do when you pick up uh, a Sidor, which is new to you, is to read how they translate the English. Sometimes it's literal, sometimes it's idiomatic, sometimes I don't, it's a mix mosh. All right. So we go to page uh, I think it's one. The morning service. And they have an opening blessing. Bob, can you turn to page one? This is one said when you wake up in the morning. And then a little bit later on, you have the original prayer itself with the things we go through in the morning. Let's go to that, which is page six. When people dive in alone, they will typically say the prayers in page six, the first uh, part of the page before the break. Bob, page six. And it, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the melody. In many synagogues, when it's done together as a group, it's said alternately the cantor and then the congregation. The tune is roughly like this, roughly because of my voice. And it translates is thanks God who rules the universe, who enables the 
rooster to distinguish day and night. That was a euphemism for understanding. By the way, in case you're curious, there was a great overlap during the rabbinic period when these prayers were put together between the Greco-Roman world and the world of the Jews. The Jews would send their kids to, Ro to Roman, uh, Greek Roman academies, the same way they did the Talmud class, and they would learn a lot of Greek philosophy. So for example, this business about the uh, rooster recalls the first part of Plato's book, The Republic, where his friend went down to the uh, red light district and sacrificed a rooster. If you wanna make more of that, talk to me privately. And you go through these prayers. These are said usually at home alone when you first put on your tefillin. Some people at that point take the tefillin off, some go on. Those who go on, go on with the full morning service. And they have, uh, uh, usually most Sidurim will then have text uh, for study. For example, verse page nine are some miscellaneous rabbinic texts. It goes on for several pages. And then they begin with uh, the Kadish to Rabbanan, which is on page 13. Medishta Rabbanon has been associated with mourners, but it also includes a prayer for teachers. The idea behind this was in the academies in Sur and Pompadina, when they finished studying, they would say these and they would bless their teachers. Later it trickled down and we became as postmarks and symbols to separate the services. And then they'll say one or two more prayers and you have the opportunity to say a mourner's Kaddish on page 15. Then we get to the beginning of the service, and it's called the Basuke de Zimra. This is part of the formal prayers. Basically, it means psalms and song. It begins, Baruch Shamar Vayalam Baruch Hu. Interestingly enough, this is an, addition, an additive to the service. Basically, the original services as we know them originated around about a, just after the Maccabees but were sort of codified during the second or third century under Raman Gamliel II, who was the head of the Sanhedrin and the leader of the Jews in the early diaspora, uh, I'm sorry, early part of the Roman era for the destruction, after the destruction of the second temple. Now, this is not part of the official service. This Tesuke de Zimra was added later. You do not need a minion for this. You can say it alone, you can say it all by yourself. Uh, it's basically praises of God. The next section we come to, which does become part of the service, is the actual Shacharit service itself. The traditional Jewish service consists of two major parts the Shema service, and the Shachari, supposedly representing the two major times of sacrifice in the Old Temple, which have been the morning service and the afternoon service. The evening service, not so much a sacrifice. And this begins with Baruch Hu, uh, and it's preceded by Hatsi Kaddish, which we spoke about a minute ago. So the Kaddish at this point becomes a signpost of the, the major divisions of the service. This is the first major uh, division in the service. It's called the Shema, and it has attendant prayers, and we're on page 30. When Kaddish is said, people sometimes stand, sometimes sit. It varies by custom according to synagogue. When people do it alone and are davening by themselves, they do not say this. All right, so let's take a look and try to do it together if we can on page 30. Baruch Adonai Will you please repeat the, the following line? Blessed is God who is deserved of praise forever and ever. I like to translate the phrase the Olam Vo'ed is to the end of time. Now the next portion of this paragraph is also said by the individual. And let's read that in the English. You illumine the earth and its creatures with mercy in your goodness day after day. You renew creation. How manifold your works, I don't know. With wisdom, you fashioned you fashion them all. The earth abounds with your kind, with your creations. 
sovereign uniquely, exalted since earliest time, and trusted in its praise and prominence since the world began. Eternal God, continue to have us with your abundant mercy every day, a pillar of strength, protecting rock, shielding, sheltering shield, sustaining stronghold. Anybody catch a nuance in there about creation? Let's look at the words again quietly. The second sentence is, you renew creation. Every day. What's going on here is a battle between the, if you will, the religious worldview and the non-religious worldview. There were two great uh, Greek philosophers, Aristotle and Plato. Plato came first. Aristotle taught in his seminar until he came back 40 years later and started his own. Plato held the belief that there was a, a, a thing or something which created time. Aristotle said, no, time always was. Well, the worldview is God created the world each day, and that's the view of Plato. Interestingly enough, our rabbis went to colleges that taught Plato, Aristotle, especially Aristotle's rhetoric, which are student notes that, as opposed to a dialogue or a book we're supposed to read. And this idea of God creating time makes time more powerful, makes God more powerful than time. Very difficult concept, very hard to deal with. But the rabbis of the times knew what they were doing. Then we go into the next paragraph, which is El Baruch Gadol. We can read that quietly in language of choice. Typically, then we sing out loud the paragraph on page 31. And it again talks about God being the ruler of everything, including time and all that's on the earth. The rest is usually said silently. And then we get to the heart of the. Uh, from either of the first service of the morning, which is Ahava Rabbah. Let's read it together. And can we get a showing of hands how many are fluent and can read Hebrew well? That's an enthusiastic response. All right, let's try it in the uh, English. Deep is your love for us, Adonai, our God. Unless your compassion. Avinu Malkano, our father, our king, you taught our ancestors life-giving laws. They trusted in you. For their sake, graciously teach us. Our, our maker, merciful provider, show us mercy. Grant us understanding and discernment. Then we will study your Torah, heed its words, teach its precepts, and follow its instructions, lovingly fulfilling all its teachings. Open your eyes to Torah. Help our hearts cleave to your mitzvot. Focus all our thoughts so that we may love and revere you. Then we will never be brought to shame. For we trust in your awesome holiness and will delight in your deliverance. Then we get to the Hebrew portion, Vahabi Enu. Vahabi Enu literally means bring us together for peace from the four corners of the earth. When we start the word Vahabi Enu, we take the corners of our seats, of our tali, and we grab the seat seat, not the intermediate fringes, but the fringes on the corner. Symbolically gathering from the four corners of the earth. And we usually wrap it around our finger, similar to this, if you can see it. Usually around the forefinger. And then we say together, bring us safely from the four corners of the earth, to lead us in dignity in our land, for you are the source of deliverance. You have called us from among all peoples and tongues constantly drawing us nearer to you that we may offer you praise and lovingly proclaim that you are one. Praise are you utter noise of us to people of Israel. And you keep them together and you say the Shema. Now in the Talmud, in Masechet Brachot, 
were taught that you should cover your eyes so that when you say the Shema, that even if a snake were winding around your leg and crawling it up, it wouldn't disturb you. So partly as remembrance of that, partly as how pieces go together. We cover our eyes and we say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And then we continue in silence or with the congregation. Some congregations do the next paragraph, which is from uh, the Vorim out loud, and then they do the next part quietly. Uh, I'd like to just take a moment and let you read the paragraph beginning on page 33. If you will earnestly heed the mitzvah I give you this day, to love and know your God, to serve God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. When you go through this, it's an easy way to, it's a, if you will, it's a, the Deuteronomic worldview, that if you do what you're supposed to do, God will be good to you and give you uh, food and crops and all that goes, and if you don't, you won't. It's what I call push-button Judaism, it was an early the theology in Judaism. And then we go to page 34, where we talk and read about the seat seat, and our fingers are still together. And I'll do it, please join me in the Hebrew. and then the congregation says and that which means truthfully all right then the next paragraph we do aloud until it comes to the middle of the paragraph we kiss the tzitzis for the last time and let them go. Now, in the Talmud, in the section called Pesach or Pesachim, they talk about the four sons. Actually, there are three, and then they added one later, which so it became four. And we know from the Haggadah that the four sons are different degrees of wisdom or understanding. When you look at uh, the Sachim and the Talmud, you realize that the rabbi is talking about four different levels of understanding and abilities. Well, there are four ways of understanding each verse in serious, I guess, liturgical Hebrew or the, or the Tanakh. And it's the mnemonic for that is pardes. Pardes that begins with a pay, and that means the shot of the simple meaning. Uh, Dalid means it's an understanding or a, a, uh, an example, uh, a story. Uh, pardes. I'm sorry, uh, his explanation. Then there's a deeper understanding. The last episode, which is from the Zohar, meaning a mystical meaning. So there are four ways of interpreting, according to the rabbis, each of these verses. All right, that's just a thought. Then we go on. And the cantor, or if you're saying this alone, you can do it. You don't have to have a menu to say the Shema. There are several concluding prayers. I'm sure you know these. Let's do it together on page 35, towards the bottom where it has the box. And let us say, now, the next paragraph 
is Sur Yisrael, which means rock of Israel. Rock, the word Sur, can also be translated as protector of Israel. And it says, Kuma be Ezra Yisrael, stand up in defense of Israel. That's when we stand up for starting the Amidah. Uh, I'm going through the process of foot debridement, so I'm not going to stand up because it hurts. But if you would like to stand up, you may. If you want to stay seated, you can. This is where you still do not mean a menu, but we say together, Sor Yisrael, Kuma be Ezra Yisrael, now, that's the end of the, just before there, with Sur ends the morning's preliminaries and the Shema. It now begins the Amidah, and the Amidah means standing prayer. It's also sometimes called the Shemana Esrei. Shemana Esrei is the Hebrew word for 18. Why? Because this originally contained 18 prayers. Now it contains 19. People were arguing back and forth what it contains and how you do it. The idea is you stay, well, if you're saying it, if you're staying this alone, you don't need a minion. But you don't do the Kedusha. If you have a minion, you do the Kedusha and you do it partly out or out. It begins with the words, I don't know, it's what God, my lips shall be open and my mouth shall sing your praises, or shall speak your praises. Then it begins the first one. Now, the Amidah can be divided up into various paragraphs. Bob, would you show the slide I prepared? Just a minute. We'll hold that for a second. I have Oops. to share a different. You know, if anyone has questions, put them in the chat box and I'll try to get to them. Okay. Okay. Can I can't you see that, the Bob? right side. I don't know if anybody else can. Can you read the print? I guess each of us can make it bigger. I've got the full screen up. Are you seeing it? All right. This was, there's a book that was published by the, uh, the Conservative Movement a couple of years ago called The Observant Life. This was the best explanation of the various prayers in the Amidah. The Amidah consists of, on weekdays, 19 blessings. They're the first three, which are the same for all the holidays, Yom Kippur, for, uh, you name it, Passover, they're the same. The last three are the same. What differs is the middle. Those are the individual requests that we have. So you see this on my notes. I hope you can read it. And this is a quick explanation of what these paragraphs are and what they do. I'm going to focus on one or two of them. All right. So let's play together. Whether you're in public or private, you could say the full Amida except for Kedusha. Back on page 36. <laughs> a or B, whichever you prefer. Just a minute. I have to. If you guys, if anybody wants a copy of this, you can email me and I'll give it to you. I'll send it to you. I'll put uh, Michael's email in the, in the, uh, All right, let's read the first paragraph on 36, either A or B together. It doesn't matter to me. I like the traditional one, which is 36A. God, open my lips so I may speak your praise. Praise for you, honor, know your God and God of our ancestors, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, great, mighty, awesome, exalted God who bestows loving kindness, creator of all. Remember the pious deeds of our ancestors, will send a redeemer to their children's children because of your loving nature. Let's pull this apart a little bit. You, God, our God, and the God of our ancestors. Why do they add in the phrase God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Why would they bother to do that? You just said it. Right of our answers is enough. Gnug shown, stop. Well, we look to and we find that Rashi, a medieval commentator who lived in the 10 and 1100s, 
of uh, mines in Spain wrote that it's because each of these fellows of our patriarchs saw God differently and that God can be whatever you make him to a certain extent. There's certain guidelines, but God is different for everyone. All right, then we go on. You are the sovereign who helps, saves, and shields. Praise us, the Lord our God, shield of Abraham. All right, now. <laughs> when we say the words, Baruch HaTad Anoy, we genuflect. Genuflect means while we're standing, we bend our knee at the word Baruch. We bow from the middle of the back as opposed to the head only at Atayu, and we raise it together at Adonai. This symbolizes approaching a king. So we also take three steps back and then three steps forward, while, and then we say Baruch Atayu, or blessed are you, Lord, as you're approaching the king. We don't do this every time we see Baruch Hashanah. We just do it here in one more place coming up. We're approaching a king. That's the imagery. That's the symmetry. It's the symbology of what's going on. Now, the idea that God sustains the earth all, all the time is in the next verse, the Chalkel Chaim, that literally means sustains earth with, sustains life with Pesed. Hesed has had a bunch of meanings, but the best English is usually mercies. And then it says, team. And that means give life to the dead. Does that mean we believe in resurrection? Remember I talked about different ways of understanding these words. Oh, uh, people are yawning. I must be boring you. I'm sorry. team means bring to uh, make live the dead, literally. Did they believe that you would come back with your body parts? and live again, maybe. Did it mean your spirit will live on? Maybe. There are many different ways of handling this. Rabbi Gilman wrote an interesting book and study about six, eight, maybe 10 years ago called The Death of Dying, where he explains that what, there, what this comes from is the Greek uh, Plato in his middle period where he talks about his knowledge system. And this was the idea of the forms spilling through to the rabbinic knowledge of the Greek culture. But it still means us means a great deal for us. Michael, can I interrupt you for one sure. second? I, someone asked me to make an announcement. Uh, to, uh, a quick announcement for the CBE, I guess maybe that's Congregation Beth Emmett, I'm not sure, religious school, seventh grade class to go to their class discussion Zoom call. Okay, that was from Sarah M. Okay, sorry for the interruption. All right, I must be boring anybody around. Now, so that's where the idea of resurrection of the Jewish body comes into the Hebrew prayers. Again, this prayers were, let me give you a quick history of the prayer book. Uh, we don't know what prayer was like in the first temple, except it consisted of animal sacrifice, and probably some of the Psalms we say today originate there, but we're not sure. Second Talmud, the second uh temple. They did sacrifice, but they also started to substitute prayer shortly after the period of the Maccabees. And this was some of the prayers they introduced. In the Talmud, Rabbi Gamliel in the second to third century of the com common era has discussions of what comes next and how you start the sentences and how you end the sentences. We note that in the time of Gamliel, the second to third century, most of the prayers were fixed in terms of their opening sentence and their ending sentence, but the middle sentence was not sure what they were. They just don't know there are different versions. And each all's late see for the master who was the leading services usually would have his own little handwritten manuscript and they were different. Then ultimately they were put together. The first prayer book was put together in Hebrew in 1525 with the Sanchino brothers in uh, uh, Italy. They, they Put together the first book. Before that, they were using hand sewn leaves that were sort of the same and sort of different. That's why a lot of our prayer is done out loud. That's also why we repeat our prayers so that people can learn them, even though they weren't there to the uh, because they didn't have books from which to learn. All right, the second line we if on page 36 or 30 A or B, you have this sentence uh, Faithful are you in giving life to the dead? And it says, Praise are you. God, master of life and death.
This is the second time in the Amida where you genuflect, where you bow the knee, bend from the waist, and then lift your head at the word Adonai. The next part is the Kedusha, which is where everyone stands. When you're praying alone, you don't do the Kedusha. You need a minion of 10 to do it. The Kedusha supposedly is put together with various verses that they were said in the Second Temple. We don't have much of a record of what was said in the Second Temple to validate that. We then start on page 38. And if you look at the outline, but you don't have to now, this suggests that man was given wisdom and intelligence as teaching uh, and the things to go with intelligence. And then it says the next blessing is return us, our Father, to your Torah. Draw us near our sovereignty, your service. Bring us back to you in true repentance. Praise are you, God, who welcomes repentance. So we go from knowledge to repentance. And these verse, inner verses can change from the weekday to Shabbat, to the Shalosh at Regalim, to the Yom Kippur, and, and Rosh Hashanah. We have remembrance verses. Why don't you take a moment and read some of these paragraphs to get a sense of what this stuff is in. If you have any question, raise your hand or put it in the chat, and I'll try to get to it. If no one will put the first question in the chat box, will somebody put in the second to be first? I had I had a hand up from Toby Shulman, I don't know when she raised her hand. Uh, it was a while back when you asked if we knew how to read Hebrew. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right. Uh, there's a really good question from Dan Moldova. Where are there some prayers which need a minion and others which can be said in smaller groups or individually? I want to flip that a little bit, but I want to answer it. it for certain purposes, you need a minion of 10. And you need a community of 10. All the prayers can be said except those for which you need a minion. The typical way of looking at needing a minion is for uh, the Kedusha, Possibly Boruch, who is there different, different people look at that differently. Kedusha and the Kaddish. Now, why they did that depends on whom you ask. The answer that has meant the most to me was that you dive into a community for certain prayers because the content of certain prayers. Let's look at the Kedusha, which is back a few pages. 137. Just read it in English for a moment. Make sure you understand much of it. Notice the use of the first person pronoun we. We is found in almost all of our prayers except one in our entire liturgy. So that can't be the reason. Maybe there's another one. One interpretation I read many years ago was the last paragraph 
that we declare through your greatness through all generations. But that never did a lot for me. I always thought that the reason was that this really required a community was a decision of the Rabbanim. And I don't know when, but I don't know exactly why they did it. I don't remember the Talmudic reasoning behind it, but I saw it at some point. I'm sorry, I can't do a better answer than that. Uh, Mike asked me a question that's, is the reason that we have different middle sections for the Amida related different leaders with different prayers in the second temple until the first Hebrew was published? Yes and no. By the second century, they had fixed the order of this prayer, even though they hadn't fixed all the content for the Amida. It's again, Robin Gamaliel. I'll explain that when we get to the end of the Amida. You know, not everybody has the same set of Nusa. There are five, seven, either seven or nine different Nusa, Nusa that we use on, on to deal with the uh, Yom to, with the with the Sidor. There is the Sephardic, which is usually considered from Yemen in the Eastern. There is the Ashkenazic, which is our, most of our North American and Northern European tradition. There's also the Oriental, there's the Yemenite, there's the Tema, and several others. That are recognized. I don't know all the differences, but there are differences. Sometimes I like to dive in with a Tema Nisi door just because I find it interesting. And they do some of the, a lot of the prayers are similar or the same, but there's some that are very different. It's really exciting to, to read it. All right, let's go back then. Many, uh, let's go to page 41. Many congregations will go silently up to page 41 and then begin out loud again at Modima Nach Nulach. Again, this is a matter, I believe, of local custom. If you're davening alone, just do it all or don't do it at all. Then we go to page 43. In the middle of that page, you have what's sometimes called the Kohanitic blessing. Many synagogues do this in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, what they call the Kohanima and Levim, and they pretend to wash the feet of the Kohan, but the Levim tend to wash the feet of the Kohanim. We believe this dates back to the second, oh, I'm sorry, to the first temple, but we're not sure. May God bless you and guard you. We're all familiar with that in the English, in the Hebrew, most of us in the English too. Again, this is very similar. This is one of the last, this is optional. You don't do it when you're alone. Uh, We go to the last blessing, <coughs> which is the official end of the Amida, Sim Shalom, grant peace in the world with happiness and blessing, pain v'chesed, it's grace and mercy and righteousness on us and on all Israel, your people. Bless us, our Father, all of us together. Bless us, our Creator, one and all, with your light, for you have given us by that light the guide to the life of caring, fulfilled with generosity and commitment, kindness and well being, and peace. May it please you to bless your people, Israel, in every season, at all times, with your gifts of peace. Praise are you, Adonai, blesses his people with Israel. That's the official end of the Amida, of the Amida, the standing prayer of the Shrona Esrei. All right. Now, I'd like you to turn to page 44 and look at the language with me very carefully. Do I still have a few minutes, Bob? Pardon? I have a few minutes. I'll go on anyway. On page 44, it says, notice the first two words. First person, 
my, singular, my God, not our God, my God. I keep my tongue from evil, my lips from speaking lies. This is the only personal petition in the entire liturgy. There are two major portions of the, to of the liturgy. There is the Shema, and there is the Amidah, and this was tacked on by the end of the Amidah. This was written by Ra Rav Bar Ravana uh, in the third, second, third century. Commonly, uh, all right, let me go back. All prayer used to be singular prayer, and it was done alone. I this, I that. Then they changed it to plural. We this, we that. It was all personal petition, all personal prayer. And around the second to third century of the common era, the people were bent out of shape. There was no personal prayers left. So Gamaliel went to his students, according to the Talmud and Brachot, and said, guys, I need a single prayer for everybody to write. And there are four in the Talmud. This is the one which has become popular and which is the one which is incorporated in our cedarine. It is not part of the official service, but it's the only time in our entire liturgy when we say, I. In Yom Kippur, we don't say why. We say, we did this, we did that. Not here. This is mine. This is my own. My own single prayer. No. What then follows on page, I'm looking for it, it's called Tachnun. Bob, do you have it up? I forgot the page. Keep going. <laughs> I believe it's on page 59. Okay. We read in English is all blurred from my monitor. Takes a second to get there, so. Sorry. Fifty-nine. We can get to it. Ah, okay. Okay. Now, this is said in many congregations. It can be said alone, and it says it's personal prayers. If you read through it, there's still no I, and it's always us. This means it's a supplication. It means to beg God for certain behaviors. Uh, I have always been uncomfortable with these prayers. They were probably instituted, I think, after the destruction of the temple in the in, in 70 of the common era. But again, I don't know for sure. I'm not sure if many people do know when it was included. But it's just I just find it offensive. And you know, some people do, some people don't. Let me give some general reflection for about three or four minutes on the on davening alone and saying, uh, Putting on tefillin. Some people just put on the tefillin, say the blessings, and take it off. Some people put on tefillin and do the beginning prayers and take it off. Some people do the Shema alone with maybe a prayer before and a prayer or two after and take it off. Some people do the full Shema service. Some people do the Shema service and the uh, uh, Mita. Some people take it off and don't just do the first three blessings. My suggestion is do what feels good to you and where it works for you. Uh, if you have the same thing as not often that I do, then don't do it. If you, again, you look at it and you say, this is something I want to say, then say it. I'm going to give one piece of advice. And one of the questions
practical advice. When you stand, uh, stand up to take off your tefillin, let me give you the best religious reason I know. You don't tangle the uh, tefillin straps in the talit as much. It was meant as a joke, but partially honest. If it's stand up when you take off your uh, tefillin, it works better and you can wrap it better. Does everyone know how to wrap this tefillin back on the boxes? Do you want me to talk about that or show you? Um, sure, we're at that point. Do you want to demonstrate that? Can you see my hands? If not, tell me what to do with them. Let's yeah, see I can you see your hand. You can? Yep. Okay. Stop, the, wrap it? stop the shares so you're on full screen now. Okay, unwrap it. The stuff around the fingers and then put it back around the palm. You reverse the procedure and tuck it in pretty good because you're going to be using your hand for a couple things. Tuck the tail in. You see that? Then you take off the, the show roche. I lost the plastic boxes from my to fill in probably at Malchabetsky's bris. <laughs> you know who Malchabetsky was? Malch means angel or messenger. Chabetsky was the butt of all the jokes on the Yiddish vaudeville. I put the knot straight down. And I bring it up and put it underneath the box and I hold it with my left hand. Then, I take the strap and wrap it over. It's hard to do when you're trying to show it. I give a lot of courage to Norm for doing this. I'm going to try to make it reasonably tight. And then you bend it back. And when you have it, when you have that done, hold the the back straps of the file together, and take the piece of leather that's to the right, and wrap it around the box like this. Try to do it reasonably tight, so it doesn't fall off all over. And then switch hands with your thumb holding the strap that you just wrapped so it doesn't fall apart. I see somebody following me. I hope it's working. Then you wrap it again like this. Around, I'm sorry, I keep on coming off the screen. When you get towards the end, leave enough to go around the box, underneath, squeeze it, and I put mine so it comes through the top. You wouldn't believe that I've done this for years and never had, and I rarely had this problem. I'm using the extra prehensible nature of my belly to help me put this together. All right, then so you don't handle them too much, you take the thing after it's put together and you put it in the left side, that's the shell roche of your talus zekel or of your tefillin zekel. Zekel is Yiddish for bag. Next step is unwrap the yod. And again, I urge you to stand up, although I'm not doing so. I have been having debriding done on my foot every other week since October, and it hurts like heck to stand up. Then you pull the strap so it's tight on that slip knot. And you bring it to the side and you just start wrapping it in the, on top of itself. Can you see or not, guys? No, nope. just up a little higher. Yep. Nope.
many years ago it was a summer camp that I was wrapping to fill in. And it was very hot. We didn't have air conditioned bunks. And I wrapped it so tight. You listen to my own advice about standing up. That I bent the, the leather box and the platform. And I had to buy new to fill in. It was no longer kosher. To fill in should be checked every decade or two by a sofa to make sure the letters haven't come off and they're still kosher. I didn't hear uh, nor mention it, but there are different ways of wearing to fill in, different types of to fill in. Uh, the most common we use today are rashi. You can tell if a set of rashis if there's a little hair standing up on this side on the shell roche. When you get towards the end, leave yourself the strip about yay long. Can you see that? Take it around the box, flap on top and wrap it as many times as you have uh, tail left. Let me do that again. And you put this on the right side inside your talus echo. And then you take off the talit and you're done. Does anyone have any questions at this point for me? I'm gonna, um, just a sec. There are more, okay, and there's a very good question. There's more than two versions. There are many versions of many of the priors. For example, the reform will say, instead of bere, uh, for the word create, they'll use the word uh, uh, which means to fix or fashion, that he fashioned the world. Also, individual rabbis have different, different versions. They, what's surprising is that when Solomon Schechter went to the Hadiza in Cairo, Egypt, he found prayer books. And how soon those prayer books were those were invented constant use. We use ours at constant use too, but we change them. The rabbi, the rabbi are free to change the, the, the middle of the serves, and they do. The only thing we keep are some of the beginnings and endings. Those have been more or less sacrosanct in the conservative Orthodox movements. Is there anything else that I feel I can explain? I've allowed everybody to unmute if they want to ask a quick, quick question and then we, we should wrap it up in about five minutes. I put in the chat, I put the link to the 11 o'clock program. Uh, Michael. Yes. Yeah. You, 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 had a, you had a tip, I didn't quite catch it. How do you, when you're taking it to fill it off to make sure that the, it doesn't get caught in the CC? Stand up. Okay. I'm serious. Stand up and try to move your arms forward away from the uh, tails of the leather. Michael. It work all the time, but it works most of the time. Yeah. Michael, I'm left-handed, but I've got right-handed to fill in. Who's your rabbi? <laughs> Excuse me? Who's your rabbi? Ra uh, rabbi Panitz. In Ask him to reverse it for you. Uh, you. You have to retie the knot. I know that. Yes. I can retie the shell roche, and there are different styles of the hand. And some of the hands I can tie. Where are you located? I'm in Virginia Beach. If you come to a um, uh, uh, seaboard region affair, bring them, and I'll try to do it, but I won't know until I see which knots it's using. Okay. Yeah. Either that or I, I guess maybe somebody uh, from the Orthodox community down here. Could Don't do bank it. on it. If you want to really bust your knuckles, mm -hmm. uh, go through go, some editions of the Talmud, like the Steinzeltz, have pictures showing you how to do it and change the nodding. I always found them less than helpful. <laughs> do you have a sofa down there? I don't think so. 
the next time that Bill Becker is heading this way, if you for a meeting or something, if you're yeah. not coming, ask him to bring him. And if I'm there, I'll try to redo it for you. Okay, thank you. I'm not a rabbi. I'm just what I call in Hebrew, Ishu uh, yeah. a simple Jew from the hills of Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> rabbi Panitz may be able to help you out. On no, that. I, I asked him uh, this morning, we had a minion before. And what I do is I put on the uh, tefillin, uh, what you would call upside down. Yes, and that then, so good. Then wrap it around. When I wrap it around my, uh, you're heart sitting heart. makes you do it ass backwards. I wrap it well. This way it keeps the knot toward your heart. Or if you come to uh, an FJMC affair where I'm there, I'll try to do it for you. Okay, but uh, I think this way's kosher too. Just instead Why of the you ask your down, down, it sits up. Ask your rabbi. Okay. The same way that there is a there you were shal, there is a Yemenites orders, Jerusalem orders, and Ashkenazic orders, and the way you wrap the things, the way they're built, slightly different. Uh -huh. I'm gonna um, if there's no more questions, I'm gonna wrap it up and thank you very much, Michael. I'll give people a couple of minutes before the eleven o'clock uh, program at Park Avenue. I put the um, the link in the chat for that with uh, Rabbi Jacob Blumenthal, who's the you know executive director of United Synagogues and uh, the Rabbinical Assembly, and with Rabbi Ellen Walnuts Fields, who's the executive director of the Women's League. So please join us at that in 10 minutes. And thank you very much. And thank you all. I hope it didn't bore you to tears. And uh, Shavua Tov to everyone, and thanks for joining us. Yasher Koach, Mike. Shavua Tov. Yes, Yasher Koach. Thank you. Yasher Koach. Thank you, Michael. Excellent job, Michael. everybody. Thank you. Great job. Wonderful seeing you, Michael. Thank you. It's better to be seen. <laughs>